We're going to read verses 13 through 19. Pretty familiar passage here. We're really going to dig into it and really get to the root of what we are seeing here. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you tonight thankful for your word. We would be so lost and so hopeless without it. But we thank you that you reveal yourself and your will for our lives through it, and that you teach us great doctrines and precepts within it by which our faith can rest upon. And I pray tonight as we look at one of the great doctrines you have given us, that God, you would just stir our hearts to see not only the the value of it, but the necessity of it, and the necessity of holding fast to it, especially in the days in which we live. So I just pray tonight, God, that you would take all of our hearts, beginning with mine, and that you would just work this truth within us, and that you would help us to be steadfast in holding fast the faith handed down once and for all to the saints. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we have a doctrinal sermon on what we call as Baptist soul competency. Soul, S-O-U-L, competency. I won't try to spell that one for you. I'll mess that up for sure. But we're talking about soul competency. And here's the thing. Whatever contributions Baptists have made to Christianity and to the world, whatever benefit we are to mankind, all of them take their root in this doctrine that we have never let go. And I pray we never will. This doctrine of soul competency. Nothing among us has blessed more men. Nothing among us has benefited the Christian cause more. Nothing among us has shown, shown brighter or given us a more lasting legacy than this doctrine of soul competency. This doctrine is the reason why, friend, this is the reason why you freely enjoy the worship you have tonight. And quite frankly, it is a shame upon Christianity and our nation that these pews are not packed. And I don't say that because I want to see bigger numbers in the bulletin, although that'd be great. I don't say that for any of that nonsense. I say it because there are brothers and sisters in this world that would give anything to be able to come here as freely as we do tonight. And the reason that you and I can is because of this doctrine, this doctrine of soul competency. It is the reason we enjoy religious freedom. It's the reason nations around the world enjoy religious freedom. It is at the heart of our every invitation following a sermon, every baptism of a believer, all of our mission endeavors to take the gospel to the world. All of it has its stem right here. In this doctrine. So what exactly is the doctrine of soul competency? Just let me spell it out to you, and then we'll take the rest of the night to understand it. Soul competency is the biblical truth that all persons have been given, the God-given ability to seek God directly without coercion or interference from any earthly power, be it religious, secular, or otherwise. This means, in not so many words, you are made by God to deal with God directly. And you don't need the church to be a bridge for you to Him, and you don't need the state to be a bridge for you to Him. You don't need anything else on this earth. God has made you in such a way that He can communicate with you directly, and you can communicate to Him. 
So we're seeing here some very critical points with an aim to educate us regarding the biblical realities of this doctrine tonight, as well as its vigorous implementation in our lives and ministry in the church to the world. And I want to offer you the following to guide our way. First of all, we're going to look at the Word of God because unless our doctrines come from God's lips, they come from the doctrines of demons and devils. And we want to see from God's Word the biblical meaning of soul competency. Then secondly, we're going to take that doctrine from our heads to our hearts and our hands, and we will consider the biblical manifestation, the biblical manifestation of soul competency to put our inward convictions to an outward practice. So may the Spirit lead us and help us in Christ now as we come first tonight to look at the biblical meaning of soul competency. Come back here to the word that we read tonight. We're just going to camp on this word this evening. What we read there is this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you... He asked them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. Within these verses, we find the age old problem that people have had with Jesus Christ. Is he a prophet? Is he a good man? Is he a moral religious teacher? Or is he just a religious nut? Who is Jesus? Now you see here that some of the Jews have been trying to answer that. And basically all of them said, yeah, we, we pretty well think you're a prophet. Which he is. But he's much more than that. And they're saying, some are saying you're Elijah. Some are saying you're you know, John the Baptist. Some are saying you're Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And Jesus just breaks off that entire conversation and he says, but you, you, my disciples, you, my apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the spokesman of the disciples, which sometimes worked out great for it and sometimes not so great. He steps up and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Here's what Jesus had to say about that. Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood, flesh and blood, nothing on earth, nothing on earth revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. You know, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, God says, is not my word like fire and like a sledgehammer that pulverizes rock. And we read in the Bible that our hearts are made of stone. And we read in the Bible that we have no spiritual comprehension of God whatsoever on our own. But we see in the Bible also that God can make the heart of stone flesh. That God can pulverize that rock and bring meaning and understanding and life of who he is into. That's what happened to Peter. Peter's confession and profession of Christ is held as a very personal and intimate matter between himself and God as Jesus acknowledges Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. And I've got news. Flesh and blood never revealed this to anybody. You can't do it. We'd like to. Oh, I would like to. There are some people that I would just love to have the ability to open their hearts and show them this is Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But I can't do that, and neither can you. And this lays the groundwork for us to see that matters of religious conviction are private matters between God and individuals. Now be very careful there. I don't want anybody running out of here pulling a President Bush on me. The first Bush, he said that his faith was a private faith, so private that you know nobody hardly even knew about it. No, Pastor Milam is not saying that. What he is saying is that when you share the gospel with somebody, you must have interest in your mind, but their response to it is a totally private decision and a choice between them and God. Not between you and them and God. Not between the church and them and God. Not between the state and them and God. But between them and God. The preacher can preach the truth. The Sunday school teacher can teach the truth. But only God can bring the truth to a soul. 
This is the ground upon which the doctrine of soul competency lays, and it is such a groundwork for us, and made so because of first the freedom of God to the soul. Careful attention needs to be paid to these words. My Father in heaven has revealed this to you. My Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Everybody in here that's saved tonight has had that same experience. The Father in heaven has revealed who the Son is to us. The Father alone. We must make every effort and understand in this doctrine of soul competency to make clear that our competency is competency under God, not independent from him. It'll never happen that way. Lest a man's spirit be convicted, his conscience pierced by God's Holy Spirit, the revelation of God's word, a person cannot come home to the human soul. God can accomplish this because he has so designed his human creatures so as to make us in his own image and our life comes none other way than by the breath of life given to us by the Spirit of God. Now, I don't want to lose you on this point, so let me bring it to a head here. Because God has made you and ordained and designed the way he has when he made man, because of that, that structure that he has given us, he has given himself the freedom to graciously communicate to our hearts directly, individually, and personally. He desires to do it, and he has designed it so that he can do it without interference from flesh and blood. The converse of this truth is found also in that the freedom of the soul to God. We've seen the freedom of God to the soul. Now we're seeing the freedom of the soul to God as through the gracious, personal, direct revelation of God. Peter, from the will of his own soul, could say, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And your Bible should have an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. That's how Peter said it. He wasn't joking around. He wasn't timid about this. This was a full confession from his heart. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The doctrine of soul competency holds that not only can God freely invest his revelation in us directly, but we can freely respond to his revelation directly without the aid or interference with any other mortal or human institution. The Pharisees did not teach Peter this. The other disciples did not teach Peter this. The Father in heaven taught Peter this. So competency declares that salvation is a matter strictly held between a man and his God. It is not one brought about through the church, supported by the state. It's not one that's going to be flung into heaven on the shirt sleeves of some parents or grandparents' faith. You're not going to know the Father or go to heaven just because you're in America. You hear that every now and then, don't you? What's your religious beliefs? I'm a Christian. Have you believed in Jesus? No, I'm an American. I've heard that a time or two. Be careful with that line of thinking. Because this comes only by the direct and alienable right of access to God himself from the man himself. And this being the biblical case, do we not have a great cause for celebration? And it's something that we need to be reminded of. Don't get me wrong. I know what y'all are thinking. I know what y'all are thinking. You're sitting there thinking, man, I've spent all week at the water booth. Now I'm here in church. I'm ready to go home and put my feet up. Hey, I understand that. <laughs> I get that. And I get everybody here just saying, yeah, Pastor, we get it. Yeah, everybody has to believe on their own. Sure, I, under, I understand that. But we need to celebrate this truth and remember it because we have found that we need not a priest. We don't need a governor for salvation. We only need Christ. Amen. That's all anybody. This is the undeniable biblical testimony and it gives God great glory and our soul's great hope to cherish and the truth to uphold. So let us go a bit further here and see how we ought to activate this truth in our lives as I bring you now secondly to the biblical manifestation of soul competency. And I, 
I don't want to go too far here with big generalizations, but the church historic and present has been divided into two camps over this passage that I read to you tonight. One takes the terms of verses 13 through 17 as very primary and necessary, and the other takes the terms of verses 18 and 19 as primary and necessary. Let me explain that. Those words read, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Now, I know what I'm about to say it might just be a total downer to some of us. Because sometimes when truth, even historic truth, is just laid out as it is, it just bums us out. And don't get me wrong, I would be the first to rejoice if Woodsfield had one church. That'd be great. If we just had one church, and we all believed the same doctrine the same way, and the doctrine was true, and it was right, and we joined them with the church of... Uh, Bellsville, and we joined in with the Church of Columbus, and there was one church in these cities and one church everywhere. And that would just be great. Let me tell you why that can't happen. It's because shortly following the death of the apostles, the church in that time took verses 18 through 19 to mean that Christ will always have a vicar on earth, a viceroy, what we call today the Pope, in the seat of Peter. And there's a lot of problems. First of all, no, that's, that's not what we're seeing here. Peter always spoke for the apostles. And the other times when he spoke, we don't build entire denominations off of what he said, but evidently we do here. And Jesus' response to him. And it might be shocking, but if you if you read their doctrines, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Catholics here in town believe this way. I know this might be mind-blowing, but I'm not naive enough to believe that all Baptists actually believe the Baptist Confession of Faith. We don't. Most of them have never even heard it or read it. And I'm sure that's true in other churches as well. But they said there, there is the seat of Peter. And the man on that seat, it's his faith that upholds the church. What that means is, you are not saved by your faith. You are saved by his faith. Did you catch that? It's not a matter of you necessarily believing. It's a matter of you doing seven or eight works that brings you sort of under the faith of that man who's the vicar of Peter, the vicar of Christ on earth. Likewise, they believed that the church and state had to be one and every citizen of the state was a member of the church and vice versa. Now how in the world do you accomplish that? They had an ingenious way to do it. Here's how you do it. Every infant born gets baptized into the church regardless of faith in Jesus because they don't need faith. They've got the Pope's faith. That's how you unite church and state. Now, this continued and the church of those days continued to dive deeper and deeper in corruption until a few souls rose up to question it. And this began the reformation of the church. And it's out of the reformation that struggling Catholics were just getting back and just, just reading what the Bible says. And they're looking at this and they're saying, whoa, we are not saved by the faith of the Pope. We are not saved by the faith of the church. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And our only authority is the word of God. Some of those guys were named names like Martin Luther. Yeah. Right. Now we got the Lutherans. <laughs> so that's an extra denomination. By the way, he never wanted that. He never wanted that. 
He wanted the Catholic Church to reform. But it won't go happen. And then you got the Presbyterians. John Calvin, of all people. Doing that. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. By the way, it's, it's easy for us to look historically at those who veered away from the Word of God. May I just encourage us that we, from time to time, too, need to stop the motion of the church and just pick up the Bible and say, is what we read in this what we are doing? Not just them. It's a word for us today as well. So you get these folks rising up and they're saying, no, no, we are, we are saved with a communication from God and us to him by grace through faith in Christ alone. And that was good for a while until the Baptist, of course, realized there was a problem with this. That problem was the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Anglican Church, all of them still connected to the state. They could not conceive of a church that was not connected to the state. And the Baptists came up and said, wait a second, yo, uh, a church connected to the state is no church at all. A state connected to the church, uni unified with the church, is no state at all. These two are separate, biblical. You may be wondering, well, why? How in the world, where in the world did they find that thought at? I mean, we say all the time, don't we, that America is a Christian nation? Anybody still saying that really today? We're a Christian nation? Oh, let me tell you what Jesus had to say about it. This was the, the mark of divorce between church and state. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God. Jesus was very clear in my covenant, there are no national saved countries. There's individuals that are saved, but no countries. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. They are two separate entities. So that was our problem with it. Of course, you knew we would have some issue with it. And we rose up and we said, look, every soul is competent to stand before God on its own. And so we came forth holding this doctrine, the chief doctrine of all. And we see the manifestation of that start to occur in society. The doctrine of soul competency upholds the truth that Christ alone is Lord of the man's conscience, and therefore no elements of society, especially the state, should be joined to the church. As I shared with you, Jesus, once and for all, made that divorce clear. He made clear that nations can't be Christians, but individuals can. Souls can. And I know you would not get that impression from many that say that the church and state need to be joined. We've been there and we've done that. It didn't work out well for us. There needs to be a wall of separation. And those who say, no, no, we need to be joined, and they'll be the first to tell you, look, you know, separation of church and state isn't in the Constitution. That's right. That is absolutely right. I'm glad they read the Constitution. You want to know where it come from? It come from Thomas Jefferson's words to a group of Baptists who wrote to him and said, look, man, we are noticing that you and the other framers of this nation are given the clear impression that the Anglican church will be the state church. And we've got a problem with that because we believe that every soul is competent to stand before God on their own. We believe in religious freedom. We think it is between a man and his own conscience as to whether he has one God, 20 gods, or no gods at all, and the state ought not to interfere. And Jefferson thought about that and wrote back and he said, you know what, you're right. There should be a wall separation between church and state. Now, why in the world would such Baptists want a separation of church and state? It's because the church at one time, unless you were part of the state-sponsored church, was required to pay taxes. And if you taught against 
the state, then you are liable to punishment. By the way, you want to know the, the chief place that Baptists have been persecuted? It's right here on our land. And you want to know the, the favorite way of persecuting us? By drowning us. Why in the world would they drown us? Because that's what we do anyway, right? We take these adults and we hold them under. So if you like to be held under, I'll hold you under for a long time. See, we have, we've been there and we've done that when the church and state have been joined. One Baptist minister, you probably remember the name from history, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island. He was so persecuted because of his Baptist faith that he said, quote, my soul was raped. Religious liberty, my brothers and sisters, hinges on soul competency. And we of all men must fight to uphold the religious freedoms of every one from the coercive and interfering rod of the state. Listen, I do not believe in one ounce at all of the Islamic religion. But I will be the first to say, if you want to believe that, it's your right, inalienable right to do that. And the state ought not to interfere with it. Now, I'm going to share Jesus with you. <laughs> but the state shouldn't put a rod against you to either believe that or not believe it. And it all comes from soul competency. Let us allow the state to have Christian morality. That's fine. Let us, especially we Baptists, be the most loyal citizens of the land. That is not in, in conflict with our faith at all. We should be. And both can be accomplished without a union held between church and state. By the way, there is going to be a union of church and state coming. You know that, right? You've read at the end of this book in Revelation, it's, it's going to happen. They're, they're going to be one. And when that happens, it's going to be a very terrible thing. But this leads us to consider the doctrine of soul competency also in the light of the sanctuary. If there is one matter we've had this have held and kept since the beginning, it is the truth that not only can individuals exercise faith in Christ to be saved, but we must do so if we are to be saved. Jesus made it clear, didn't he? I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father, but how? Through the church? No. Through the Pope? No. Through me. Through me. This is why we call men during invitations to come to Christ. This is part of the reason why we hold to believers baptism only. This is also why we don't need to try and get cute or clever or relevant with the gospel. God is powerful enough to speak to the human heart through his word. We don't have to make it cute. We don't have to make it a gimmick. We just have to share it honestly. And God will do that work that only he can do to convict men of their sins and to grant them repentance and faith to believe and to have eternal life. So let us be obedient and let Christ build his church. And this leads us lastly to see soul competency from its impact in sinners. Peter was a man just like all men. He was bound in sin, guilty before God and desperately needed the salvation that comes from Christ. And he fell. That salvation, not from me, a naturally born Jew, not in statistics, not even in good sentiments or works, but in a still small voice that told him, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So competency is the road that the spirit travels to our hearts, that our hearts might travel to the feet of Christ personally, intimately, and directly for salvation. May that be accomplished from the Spirit to every heart, to the glory of Christ's name. Herschel Hobbes once told the story about Billy Graham preaching a good sermon on soul competency to a civic club some years ago. And Hobbes remarked at how many men who were members of churches in that civic club came up to Billy after the service and said, I have been in the church all my life, and I have never heard that. Can you imagine? They had never heard. There is hope for you directly through God. You can talk to God. 
You can put faith in God and you will be saved. They had never heard. They've been in churches all their lives. And surely we would agree. It is the best news we have ever heard. That Jesus died for us personally and that by personal faith in him, we can be saved. It can be that way for you tonight. If you need the salvation of our Lord Jesus. You may come down this aisle and tell me that you're coming to Jesus. you got to know. Surely you know. Nothing magical happens by coming down this aisle. And I am sure not the one that's going to make you right with the Father. I'm just a servant who gives this word. Right. It is Christ that you run to and receive the salvation of your soul. Run to him tonight if you need him. And if you have, then may we all rejoice and celebrate this truth and go forth sharing the gospel knowing that God has made us towards this end. That we might know him personally and directly. He's given us the freedom in our hearts to respond to him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we pray tonight, God, if there's any here that needs your salvation, that you by your grace, Lord, would save them this evening. And Father, I pray for all of us who have been saved. That God, you would just help us to be reminded tonight, refreshed tonight. And rejoicing tonight in the truth that those that we share the gospel with have every opportunity to respond to you. Help us to be clear, Lord, that it's between them and you. Help us to be clear that it's, it's not us and it's not the church and it's not living a good enough life, God. But it is putting faith in you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I just pray that you would use this in us all to the glory of your name, and we pray these things in Jesus' name.